Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it written in our heart and mind this night. Thank you for revelation. Thank you that we will walk in the light as the word that comes forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Tonight we're going to share with you on the subject of the parable of the sower, which is extremely important for you to understand. In fact, the prophecy is really kind of laid the laid the the basis for bringing things forth that talked about walking in the light and seeing this grow and develop in your life. In Mark chapter 4, verse 2, it says, He taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine. The parables brought forth a revelation of the doctrine of the Lord. He said, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. Came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, Fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. When the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. It didn't produce. Some fell among thorns. The thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred. This is the parable that is important for you to understand. He says, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. We need to have ears to hear so we understand. When he was alone, they were about him with the twelve, ask of him the parable. And he said unto them, unto you is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. We're to know these spiritual mysteries revealed by the Lord. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. They're not to be parables to us. They're to be revelations to us. The Holy Spirit will bring that forth. That seeing they may see and not perceive, hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. He said unto them, Know ye not this parable? How then will you know all parables? If we don't understand this one, we're not going to understand all the parables. That means this is extremely important. A parable is a comparison of something, would be of the natural, revealing spiritual truths. It's a comparison, bringing revelation. It brings something that's of the natural that has a heavenly or a spiritual meaning that God wants to bring forth to us. And the parable's explanation, as they want to know the explanation, is given in Mark 4, beginning with verse 14 and following. This also, there's an account of the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13 we'll be looking at, and also in Luke chapter 8, the three places where we see the revelation. And they're all important to look at because they all fit the pieces together in the puzzle to understand about the parable of the sower. The subject of this parable is the Word of God and how the Word of God will produce fruit in your life how it will bring forth the promises and the blessings of God. The object of the parable is how to bring forth this hundredfold fruit from the Word, and it will show that it develops from 30, 60, hundredfold fruit, more fruit, and much fruit in your life. It's also a revelation of Satan's activity because we see activity that comes to try to take the word out of your heart and to stop it from producing, to hinder it in some aspect. And it shows you different ways that he works to attempt to take the word out of your heart. One thing we must realize, every time you hear God's word, it will get into your heart. We see over in Proverbs chapter 4, in verse 20, it says, My son, attend to my words, and climb thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, and keep them in the midst of thine heart. They get into your heart. Once they're in your heart, you must keep them. You must guard. Make sure that they stay in your heart. There is an enemy, Satan, who wants to come and take the word out of your heart. As the word is heard, it gets into your heart immediately. That's how we got born again. When we got born again, what happened? We heard the Word of God, the Gospel brought forth to us, and it tells us how we got born again. 1 Peter 1.23 Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Otherwise, it was like seed sown in us, just like the sower sows the seed. 
the seed of the word of God was sown in us by the word of God, which lives and abides forever, is sown in us. And then as we act upon the word, it produces the results, it produces the promise, it will produce the fruit in our life. God wants us to get the word in us in all areas, do what he says, not let the devils take the word out of our heart, not let it not produce, he wants it to bring forth fruit in our life. We go back to Mark chapter 4, where we begin to look at this explanation of it. In verse 14, it begins to talk about the word sown in the different types of ground. The different types of ground, the ground is a type of the heart, the word sown in your heart, and what happens when the word is in your heart. In verse 14, the sower soweth the word. These are they by the wayside where the word is sown. When they've heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. This tells you something. When you hear the word, what happens? It gets in your heart immediately. And that is important to realize. There has been a teaching that has gone forth in the body of Christ that says that the word first gets into your head. And after you hear it and hear it and hear it, it'll finally drop down into your heart. It's come forth from Word of Faith teaching and different other groups. It's a lie. It is false. The Word gets into your heart every time you hear it. So there's not a problem getting the Word in your heart, thinking it's in my head and after I hear it and hear it, it'll finally drop down into my heart. It's a lie. It gets into your heart every time you hear it. And so in your heart now it can produce fruit, but it all depends on what you do with the Word and you must keep it in the midst of your heart. Notice, you have an enemy that comes. Who's our enemy? It's Satan. And what's he doing? He's coming immediately to take away the word that was sown in the heart. It means Satan knows that this word in your heart, it's going to do something if he doesn't get it out. And he's got to come after that. He is your enemy, and he is going to attack the word that's in your heart. He's really not after you. He's after what's in you, the word. Because he knows the word will produce fruit, it will bring forth the promises, and it will accomplish the things that God wants to accomplish, because he is the word. When the word comes into you, that's God coming into you. So Satan's got to do something to try to get the word out of your heart. He comes here immediately to try to take it out. Well, how is he able to get it out? In Matthew chapter 13, we see parallel to this. We go over to verse 18 where he says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. And he says, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and this also brings a revelation, the word of God is the word of the kingdom, which is the rule and the reign of God. Not only will it bring forth promises, but it will also show you how to rule and reign and walk in victory in your life. And it says, if he understandeth it not, he doesn't have a spiritual understanding of it. Then cometh the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. If you don't have spiritual understanding, will you act upon it? Will you do what it says? Will you believe it? No, because you don't understand it. You and I must get spiritual understanding of the Word of God, which the Holy Spirit will bring that forth and reveal that to us. But if we don't have spiritual understanding, then the enemy is able to take it out of our hearts. So it's important that you and I get understanding of the Word of God. We see over in Luke chapter 8, verse 11, in Luke's account, he says in verse 11, the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. So we know this seed is talking about the word of God that comes to be sown in you. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. This shows you that if you will believe that word, then it will produce the salvation of the Lord. Also, if you will believe that word, then God will bring forth the revelation of it to you as you act upon it and do what he says. Those that believe will do what he says. So as he brings spiritual revelation to you, you believe the word. That's one thing that's important. Whenever the word comes to you, always believe it. If you do not believe it, if you get in doubt, you get in unbelief, you, you don't receive it, then what's going to happen? You aren't going to get spiritual understanding. The devil will be able to take it out of your heart. God's word is the truth. You believe the word, 
and you thank him for giving you spiritual understanding and he will bring that forth. Now as the word is in your heart, it's going to produce the salvation of the Lord in you. The problem was they did not have understanding. And it was interesting, we go back over to Matthew chapter 13, when it makes, talks about this understanding. When you get understanding of it, you need to maintain it continually. Understanding here, we look up this word, and it happens to be a present tense. It's not as if all of a sudden I got it and then that's it. No, you need to continue to have the spiritual understanding, which means that it's possible for you to have it at one point and then not have it at a later time. And why is that? Because you don't walk in it. I have seen people that have had understanding in a particular area, but because of the fact that they didn't do the Word, or maybe they heard other teaching or false teaching, and it caused them to turn away from the Word, they lost the spiritual understanding of that, and they didn't have it anymore, because they did not walk in it and do what the Word says. In other words, we must believe the Word, and we must do what it says, and continue in spiritual understanding in order to see the fruit come forth from the Word of God in our life. Now, it's going to be revealed, the truth of the Word is going to be revealed by the Holy Spirit's work. In 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. These things are spiritually discerned by the Lord, bringing revelation through the Holy Spirit, so we are to understand these things. This is why when you begin to study the Word, pray a prayer. What he says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16, this is the prayer that they prayed for the church at Ephesus, one of the ones. And he says, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. He wants to bring revelation to you in the precise, correct knowledge of Him, as He says, and the eyes of your understanding, or the eyes of your mind to produce understanding, being enlightened. Otherwise, you pray this prayer that the eyes of your understanding, through the Word being revealed to you in your mind, spiritually discern, that you will be enlightened, you will have light come into you, you'll be able to now see, be able to perceive things, as well as know what the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So we need to pray for spiritual understanding as you are st studying the Word of God, and God will bring it forth. If you do not have that, the devil takes it out, it stops the Word from producing the salvation of the Lord in your life. You must believe the Word. If you doubt it, it's not going to produce anything in your life. It only is going to produce in those who believe the Lord and believe exactly what His Word says. We go back to the next type of ground. And in Mark chapter 4, we back in Mark chapter 4, in verse 16, it says, These are they, verse 16, says, These are they likewise that are sown on stony ground, who when they've heard the Word, remember it got into their heart immediately, immediately receive it with gladness. They had a right attitude. They didn't doubt, they didn't wonder, they weren't slow to take hold of this. They believed it obviously and accepted it, submitted to it as a truth. And it says they received it with gladness. The word receive here is the word lambano, which means they took hold of it with gladness. God wants you to take hold of the word with gladness, to apply it in your life. But these had no root in themselves, so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, that's the devil coming, immediately they're offended. We'll come back and talk about that in a moment. But we want to go over to Matthew's account now, chapter 13. We see down here in verse 20. He that received the seed into stony place is the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Again, he's taking hold of it to apply it in his life. Yet he has not rooted himself. He endures or endures for a while. When the tribulation or persecution again arises because of the word, remember it's coming because of the word, by and by he gets offended, he turns away from it. In Luke chapter 8, 
we see Luke's account of this, and we pick up here in verse uh, 13. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. Now, this word receive is a different word. It's not lombano, which means to take hold of it. This word is the word decamai. Decamai is a passive reception, it means, while lombano is an active reception. Otherwise, this word here in decamai refers to accepting it with a passive reception of what is coming to you. It literally really means to accept what is offered unto you. So that shows us how you and I are to receive the word. Two things. We have a ready reception for what's offered to us, and two, we take hold of it to apply it in our life. Many, there's many people that just have a ready reception, they receive it, but they don't take hold of it to apply it in their life. So reception involves, they have a ready reception to receive what comes forth, then taking hold of it and doing what it says. And they, of course, they have it with joy. These have no root, which for a while believe. These guys believe for a while, but what happened? The enemy attacks, and in time of temptation, it says they fall away. So what we see here so far is that you and I are to receive the word with a ready reception, take hold of it, apply it in our life, and be a doer of it. That's how you apply it. If we're going to apply it in our life, then we're going to put this in operation. We see in Matthew chapter 7, it tells us about the guy who, in verse 24, where he's hearing the word and what he does with it. And this is important in us, for, our, for us in our life. Matthew 7, 24 says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and this is someone who's hearing it continually. The word heareth is a present tense verb indicating someone who's continually hearing the word, which is good. And doeth them. This speaks to the fact that this guy is taking hold of it. If you take hold of it and apply it in your life, what are you going to be doing? You're going to be doing what the Word says. And this, again, is present tense as well. He's continually doing the Word. I'll liken him to a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And that's what God wants. He wants us to be wise. The key is what you are doing with the Word. If we have a ready reception for it, we're taking hold of it, but the devil comes in with these other things and causes us to move away from it because we haven't had any root in us. Why haven't we had a root in us? Why haven't we had this thing established like a foundation laid? It's because we haven't done it. Otherwise, you've got to do something with the Word when it comes to you for, in order to stay in you and become a part of your life and able to, to hinder or to be able to resist the, the attacks that the enemy brings against you with his temptations. So, here, this guy's a wise man, built his house upon a rock. Rain descended, floods came, winds blew. That's a type of just Satan coming, just like Satan comes to try to take this word, stop this word from producing. And beats upon the house, it will attack you in some way. This is why when you hear the word of God, you wonder, why well, I heard the word, and then all of a sudden these attacks came at me. That's the devil coming against you because he's after the word that has come into you because he does not want you to do the word. Otherwise, he knows it will produce fruit, bring the salvation, healing, deliverance, promises of God in your life. So he is going to attack that. That's why you have attacks when you hear the word. Well, should that make me not want to hear the word? Because I don't want to have attacks. That's what some people's mentality is, which is totally wrong. You're never going to have any fruit. You're never going to walk in victory. You're never going to see the promises come to pass. You're never going to overcome without the Word. And the Word is God. You want God coming into your life. But spiritual reality is this. When God's coming into your life through the Word to start working and bring forth promises and all the things that He wants to do, the devil is going to attack. That is spiritual reality. You've got to understand that's going to happen. So you are ready to deal with the attacks that would come against you. And notice it said it beat upon the house and it fell not. Why did it not fall? Why was it able to stand the attacks of the enemy? Because it was founded upon a rock. The word founded is a word which means to lay the foundation. The foundation was laid. Oh, that's someone who's got root established. If you put the root of seed in the ground, you've got to get this thing established. So the root is established. That's like a foundation laid. 
That's what has to happen. And this foundation being laid isn't just that I suddenly did it and then I'm going to be able to solve, you know, to be able to resist all the attacks of the enemy. It's very interesting when we look at this word in the Greek, it happens to be a pluperfect tense. The pluperfect tense is a tense that is referring to something that's been accomplished in the past. It's a past tense, but it has past effects that have been established. Otherwise, it's different from the perfect tense. The perfect tense is something that's been accomplished in the past with present effects. The pluperfect is one that's been accomplished in the past and it was established in the past. It has nothing to say about what's going on in the future or in the present, but it's a, something that's been accomplished in the past. Otherwise, the work has been done and it had some results in the past. Well, that's what this is talking about. This means otherwise, you're not going to be able to get in the word here and do the word all of a sudden and be able to conquer all the enemy's attacks just all of a sudden. No, it's because you have this foundation laid. It's been established in you. It has been worked into your life. You are a consistent hearer and doer of the word. Not just like a suddenly t today I decided I was going to do something and, and then I won't have any problems standing against the enemy. No, you've got to get this so built just like the house, the house has to get built. In the middle of building the house and the storm comes, are you gonna get anywhere? No, you're gonna get blown away still because you haven't got this thing established yet. You've gotta get your spiritual house built in area after area so that you can become strong and then you'll be able to stand against the tax of the enemy. The foundation has to be laid. Verse 26 goes on and says, everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and this is someone who's hearing the word consistently, present tense again, but it says, and doeth them not. This guy is not doing the word that he heard. He might have had a recept read a receptive for it, receptiveness to it, and he's been hearing it constantly, which is great, but it's what you do with the word that's so important. And when it talks about doing, again, this is a present tense indicating that this guy was not consistently doing the word of God. He's likened to a foolish man. This means, from God's standpoint, if we don't do the word that we hear, we're really foolish. We're not being wise. The wise one applies the word and does what it says so it will bring forth fruit, knowing what the word will do in you. It will bring forth promises and blessing. The guy who doesn't do it, he doesn't realize what the word will do in him, and he also obviously doesn't realize the devil's going to take this out of his heart if he doesn't do the word and get it established. What happens to him? He's built his house upon a sand. The rain descended, floods came, winds blew, beat upon the house. Same, atta same attack. The devil will attack every person, same way. Rap it comes against each one of us. And this time, though, it fell. And great was the fall of it. Or more literally in the Greek, its fall was great. And the word was shows the fact that this isn't necessarily all of a sudden everything just went down and all of a sudden. Actually, the word is showing, when you look up the word was, it is an imperfect tense verb. The imperfect tense is also a past tense, but what it means, it is something that is an ongoing action in the past. Otherwise, it wasn't just suddenly, bam, it's all gone. Oh, that's it. It shows a continuousness of this occurring in the past, otherwise an ongoing fall, essentially. That shows you that, you know, the devil works at you and your fall will not just be all of a sudden, usually. Usually it's little by little by little by little as you are going downhill. I've seen this with people, people that aren't in the Word like they should be, and it seemed like they just kind of just, their spiritual life goes downhill little by little by little because they haven't been hearing and doing the word. Not just all of a sudden they're just down in the gutter. No, it's little by little. And this is what this is speaking here. There will be a great fall, but it's going to be a little by little. And all of a sudden you were at this point, and now you're way down here and you wonder, what happened to me? And it's happened over time. This is why hearing and doing the word is absolutely essential in your life. Kind of like with that prop, the word that came forth about how things got dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. It's kind of the guy who's falling little by little by little. He's going downhill in a spiritual life. So we've got to get the foundation laid. The foundation is laid by you hearing and doing the word. Now over in Mark's account, 
we go back over to this in this second type of ground. Verse 17, he had no root in himself. His foundation was not laid. It was not established. You've got to get the foundation laid. It's not going to happen unless you be a doer of the word that you hear consistently. It must become your lifestyle. This is the way I live. I hear and do, I hear and do, I hear and do, I hear and do consistently. The more you do so, the more you are established. That foundation has been laid in your life. Of course, this is why he only endures for a time. Just for a time. And remember, in Luke's account, what happened was, the enduring for a time is described as him just believing for a while, as we see. He received the word, he had no root, which for a while believed. He believed for a while. But then when the attacks came, if you really believe, you're going to do what it says. You're going to keep on. You're going to walk in the light of it. Instead, he backs off of it. Because it says in time of temptation, because that shows you the devil's temptation will come against the word in you. What's it say? Fall away. It's not like he just accidentally fell away. This word fall away is different. It is a word, aphistemi, which means to stand away. It comes from apo, which means away, and histemi, which means to stand. It literally means to stand away or to stand off. And it's interesting that this one has continually moved in this direction. And who's the one who's doing it? The person is standing away. Otherwise, they're not continuing in the way of the word because they yielded to the temptation. Otherwise, the temptation doesn't cause you to stand away. It's you that stands away because you don't continue to do what the Word says. You only believe for a while. And the reason is because you didn't have the spiritual foundation laid. You didn't have the root system established. And the enemy will come and he will stop that production of the fruit of the Word. Now, what does he use? We see in Mark chapter 4. As we go back over to Mark's account, he had no root in himself, he endured for a time. Afterward, when affliction, affliction is this Greek word phlipsis. Phlipsis means pressure. He will bring pressure against the word. The devil will press you to try to get you to back off the word of God and not continue in it and be doing what the word says. We see that you will have pressure that comes against you to not walk in the word. John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus said, These things I've spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. This is the word slipsis, pressure. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. If he overcame, you can overcome it too. The pressure to not do what the word said will come. It'll come from the world. It'll come from worldly-minded people. It'll come from people that try to stop you from walking in line with the Word of God. You've got to be ready to continue in the Word and resist the pressure, the attacks that the enemy brings against you. We see over in Acts chapter 7, verse 10, here, it's speaking about when Joseph was sold into Egypt, how God was with him in verse 9. And it says that he delivered him out of all his afflictions or his pressures. He had a lot of pressures. Here, he's thrown in the, you know, the, down there in, in the, the pit, and you know, the Midianites have him, and now they're taking him you know, to Egypt. He's got a lot of pressure coming against him. And then, you know, Potiphar's wife's after him, <clears throat> and he's got pressure, you know, pressure to fall into the sexual sin, <clears throat> and he has to stand against that. He had attacks that came against him, and then he gets blamed for it when she lies, of course, and he gets thrown into the prison. You know, he had a lot of things, but he had to keep his eyes on the Lord. And God gave him favor in the prison. And he became really the, the leader in the prison, you know. God used him to minister in the prison. So he had to come through the attacks that came at him. Even though circumstances negative may come, you've got to deal with the pressures that will come. You cannot back off the word of God. He did not back off. He got delivered out of these things. God will deliver you out of all these. Verse 34 says, I've seen, I've seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt. I've heard their groaning and come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send them to Egypt. God will come to deliver you. He'll deliver you from the pressures. But there will be pressures that will come against you. 
It's even interesting, it says over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 16, For this cause we faint not, that though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, or this pressure that's coming against us, is but for a moment. It worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. The things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. That tells you something. When these pressures come against you, you must be sure that you're looking at the things that are not seen at the Word. If you look at the things that are seen, because the pressures will try to take your eyes off the Word of God to get you to look at anything else but the Word of God, and then you'll end up having a fall, and they'll be able to take the Word out of your heart. That's why we've got to keep our eyes on the Word What's he try to do? He tries to get you looking at the situation that comes, the temptation or whatever attack might come against you. You've got to be ready to conquer any of the attacks that would come against you. Remember, a good example of this would be over in Matthew chapter 14. Peter's walking on the water. He's going on the water. Supernatural thing. His eyes are on Jesus. Verse 40. When he saw the wind boisterous or strong and mighty, he got his eyes on what the enemy was doing. And he let fear come into him. He got his eyes off. Otherwise, was he looking at what he should have been, at the Lord? No. He got his eyes instead on what the enemy was doing, and he responded to it and reacted to it. Obviously, his eyes was on the strong wind because he got afraid instead of keeping his eyes on Jesus. If you react to the attacks that the enemy brings against you, which will always try to take you out of believing the Word, doing the Word, staying in faith, keeping your eyes on the Lord, and whatever the situation is, you're going to be in trouble. Because he's, all the temptations are designed to get you off the Word or get you to stop doing the Word or working the Word in some way to get you off track. Get you looking at your circumstances. Getting you looking at what the devil's doing. Getting you looking at this. And that's what happened here. And of course, he begins to sink. This is the way the devil could take the word out of your heart. In fact, even entering into ruling and reigning. You remember, we've been delivered out of the authority of darkness. We've been brought into the kingdom, the position to rule and reign. Well, when you begin to rise up and you begin to use your authority, the enemy's not going to lie down and just quit and give up. No, he is going to fight. There will be pressure. There will be attacks that come against you. And look at what it says in Acts 14.22. This is when Paul was going forth to the different places and he was confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. And then he also says that we must, it was necessary, it was binding, you must, through much tribulation, the same word, thlipsis, enter into the kingdom of God. You're going to go through much pressure that will come against the word trying to get you to back off of it so you will not do what the Word says or you will not use your authority against the enemy to enter into the kingdom. This is where people in the body of Christ have made great mistakes. They begin to fight against the enemy. The enemy fights back and they have all these attacks and they think, well, maybe I shouldn't try to do that. So they back off, throw in the towel on spiritual warfare or deliverance or warfare intercession and think, well, I'm just going to trust that God's going to take care of it and I'll leave it all to God which is a mistake. When God told us to use our authority, He told us to cast them out. He told us to engage in the warfare. They failed to understand that the warfare will be there. The attacks will be there. You are going to go through much pressure to enter into the rule and the reign of God over the enemies. While you're using your authority, the devil will come against you. That's why you've got to continue in using your authority, continue in casting out, continue in warfare intercession, continue in speaking the mountain, continuing to resist the temptation, whatever it might be, you've got to continue in the things of the Word of God. Otherwise, you will let that pressure get you to back off. And what happened, of course? Because of the pressure. We see what it said. What did they do? It said, in time of temptation, they stood away. They gave up. Or, as Matthew account says, in time of the temptation, what did they do? They backed off. And they got offended. 
it says here they had it for joy, but then it says, tribulation, persecution, rise because of the word, that's why it came, by and by he got offended. He got enticed to sin, he got offended, he got upset, and he moved back away from it. Offended refers to also to someone who got enticed to sin, otherwise he fell for the temptation. And he didn't continue in the word, obviously. He moved away from this. Otherwise, as Young, or Young's brings out better understanding, he stumbled. You'll stumble in some way. You get off the word, you won't continue in faith, you won't continue to use your authority, you won't continue to war, you won't continue to speak forth the word. You back off because of the pressure. You look at the circumstances and think other things. You don't keep your mind on the Lord. You might get double-minded. You can't take hold of anything of the Lord if you're double-minded. You've got to guard yourself in all these areas, see? We've got to stay single-minded upon the Word. So the devil uses pressure to come at you to try to stop you from seeing the promises come to pass. Another thing, the Word work. The second thing we see here is persecution. He will try to bring persecution against you, to not continue. And this is attacks coming from the outside. And this, of course, we see that when the church was walking in the ways of the Lord, they were seeing the glory of God poured out on the early church. Did the devil stand by idly and just watch the whole world come to the Lord? They were all getting turned upside down. Jesus was moving, uh, the Holy Spirit was moving mightily, and people were receiving Jesus, getting born again. Multitudes, as it talks about in Acts 5, and they were seeing healings and deliverances and great things happening. Oh no, they, uh, this, the, this situation uh, the devil stirred up all the religious people and stirred up all these ones to come against what God was doing. Acts 8.1, he even had Saul was on his team at that time, the devil's team. He was consenting unto his death, talking about Stephen. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church. There was a Jerusalem, and they all got scattered abroad. The devil stirred up persecution. We haven't seen much persecution but you can see it's coming. It's beginning to come forth in areas of, this, of the world, and it will come. There will be persecution that will come, especially you probably will, as the, the body of Christ comes to the place of growing up in the things of God, and we become that glorious, perfected, strong, mighty church. You better believe the persecution will be coming at the same time. There will be tremendous persecution that will come against the church in the last days. At the same time, remember, we're going to become strong, we're going to be mighty, God will deliver us out of all of the attacks that come against us. You got to get, but you've got to get strong. You've got to get yourself filled with the Word, become, have that foundation laid in your life. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And of course, who's that? That's the devil. It talks about things that he'll use. Tribulation. That's the word pressure. I try to press you to get you to turn away from walking in the ways of the word. Distress. He'll try to bring some calamities at you. Persecution. There's the persecution. These things are coming because of the word. He wants to stop you from walking in line with the word. As well as famine and nakedness and peril and sword. All these different means to try to stop, to come against you. Because he considers you uh, someone he's going to destroy Verse 36, as it's written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long, we're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. That's the devil's view of us. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You're more than a conqueror. You can overcome as you walk in the ways of the word of God, doing what the word says, using your authority, walking uprightly before him. God will deliver you. He said, I'm persuaded. And you've got to be persuaded. To neither death, nor life, nor angels, or principalities, powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature is able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing's going to be able to separate us because we are going to walk in the ways of the Word and not let the enemy come and take any of these things, the, the Word, out of us or stop us from going forth. God will deliver you. You must know these scriptures, 2 Timothy 3, and you must know that he'll accomplish it. Look what it says in verse 11. Paul's testimony, 2 Timothy 3, 11. Persecutions, the attacks. Afflictions, this is talking about sufferings. It's a different word, not talking about pressure. The sufferings that he went through. 
which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, every place he was going, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Out of how many? All of them. God will deliver you out of every attack, any kind of attack, at any time, whatever might come against you. You've got to have confidence that he'll deliver you. Right. Look what he did with Paul, delivered him out time after time after time. He'll do the same for you. And says, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You will have persecution coming against you. It's going to happen. All that live godly are going to suffer this. So, you're going to have to just be ready for it. Of course, you've got to live godly. You can't live any other way. But it also tells you that, if, you know, if you're not suffering persecution in any aspect, you probably aren't really living too godly. The more godly you live, you will have persecution, but God will deliver you out of them. So don't be afraid of persecution. It's actually a mark showing the fact that, hey, I'm, I'm, I must be living godly because the, the devils are really coming against and attacking, trying to stop me from going forth and doing these things. Uh, we're going to keep pressing through, and God is going to deliver us out of all these things. In Acts chapter 9, verse 4, here, when Saul was approached by the Lord, he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Ah, the persecution is coming against Jesus. Don't get your eyes on me. Look what they're doing to me. They're actually coming against Jesus in you. Why persecutest thou me? Because it's the Lord who he was persecuting in coming against all the church. He's persecuting the Lord. He says, Who art thou, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. He was coming against all the Christians, but he was actually persecuting the Lord. So no, it's attack from the enemy against the Lord in you. And God will rise up and give you victory. He'll deliver you. He will deliver you out of the attack, so you've got to be ready to do what the Word says, and He will bring you out of it. Now, God wants us to be able to stand against these temptations. Temptations will come. Don't ever stand away from temptations. Remember, that's what they did. Matthew 26, over in verse 41. What does it tell us? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Remember, in time of temptation, they stood away. They gave up. They stopped continuing in the Word. You got to watch, be spiritually in tune, and discerning things properly, and also be praying. Prayer will build you up, strengthen you, releases the power of God, brings God on the scene, puts the angels in operation. You need to learn how to pray with all manner of pray, prayer effectively so you don't enter into the temptation. You're going to resist the enemy. The spirit indeed is willing, ready, but the flesh is weak. That tells you, you've got to be operating in the spirit if you're going to overcome temptations. And you'll operate in the spirit because you're walking in line with the word of God. If you get into the flesh, eh, you're going to be weak. You're going to fall for those temptations. That's why you don't respond out of your feelings. You don't respond out of the flesh the way I feel. You respond according to the spirit. So you do not fall for the temptations and end up getting offended or stumble and fall into ways of sin. The next one that we see, as so we go back over to Mark chapter 4, we pick up the next, the third type of ground, and this is the one that's sown among thorns, in verse 18. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. In every case they hear the word, so the word gets in their heart, every single one of these. And then what happens? The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, and the loss of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So this is implying the fact that they received the word, they must have been doing the word, it was starting to produce and, their, and bring forth what appeared to be some fruit in their life. But it got choked out, and it never brought forth the fruit. It never came to fruition. It was working, but it never brought forth the fruit because of these things entering in. The cares is this Greek word, marimna, which refers to cares, worries, anxieties. You cannot let the cares, worries, or anxieties, and this is not the world word for world, it's cosmos, this means age. The cares, anxieties of this age that will come against you. 
anxiety, care, worry about all kinds of things. They're going to try to come against you to cause you to see the word be choked out. You can't let it enter in. How am I going to stop this from entering in? Well, you're going to do what you need to do with the cares, worries, anxieties. In Luke chapter 10, over here in verse 41, this is talking here, if we go back to verse 38, here's where Martha received Jesus into their house. She had a sister called Mary, which sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. She did the right thing. Martha was cumbered about with much serving, came to him and said, Lord, dost thou now care of my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. Jesus answered and said, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things. It's interesting. Whenever you see, and this may not be true in all cases, but whenever you see someone's name said twice, why is it said twice? Why do you say Martha? Martha, Martha. When you see something that's spoken twice, that tells you it's going to speak twice. It was speaking once at this point in time, but you know what? It's going to speak another time in the end times that people are going to allow themselves to be careful and troubled about many things in the end. As the pressure comes and the persecution and affliction and all the things that are going to go on in this world, because this world, evil men are going to wax worse and worse as we go down that way, you better understand there is going to be anxiety and all kinds of things that are going to, just the whole earth going to be all unraveled. The people's hearts are going to be failing for fear. Uh, they see all the things that are coming on the earth, all the things that are happening. It is going to be a time of tremendous commotion, disquietness, you know, trouble, anxiety easily if you don't have your eyes on the Lord. Oh, she was careful and troubled about many things, and that was a mistake. One thing is needful. Mary hath chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. She had her eyes upon the word. And we even see in Luke chapter 21, this is an end time chapter. It speaks here in verse 34 how you're to take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts would be overcharged. It'll affect you adversely. That's where the word's in, you remember. With surfeiting, this is a someone who has been drinking wine and drunkenness, intoxication, and the cares, marimna, anxieties of this life, the bios life, and so that day come upon you unaware. So why you're not ready, you're not prepared because you're full of anxiety. You haven't gotten yourself in, built up in the things of God and walking in victory and strength, and you're not going to be prepared for what comes against you. God does not want us to have anxiety about anything. What do we do when we have these situations that would present themselves? Well, Philippians 4, 6 tells us straightforward. Be careful, be anxious for nothing. God does not want you to have any anxiety, worry, or care about anything. What's the answer? In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request, this is the word atema, which means your demands of what's due you, the noun form of aiteo, be made known unto God. Otherwise, you pray the word with thanksgiving. And when we do it thanksgiving, what are we doing? We're going to be taking hold of the promises to minister to us in that particular area, uh, in the time of need. And what will happen? The peace of God that passes all understanding shall guard. The word keep means to guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Otherwise, you're not going to have, you're not going to let anxieties overtake you. You're going to be a person of prayer. You're going to have to learn to pray the word with thanksgiving, and take hold of these promises that God has for us. And also, what else do we do with cares, worries, or anxieties? 1 Peter 5, 7 tells us what we do. You aren't going to carry them. Casting all your care and anxiety upon Him because He cares about you. Not the same word. This is Merimna. All your care, worry, and anxiety, because people thought to care about me, does that mean he's carrying cares, worries, anxieties? No, this means he just cares about you. He's going to take care of you. You get rid of all the cares, worries, and anxieties, Marimna. It is going to choke the word. You cannot let care, worry, anxiety be upon you. It will choke the word and stop it from becoming unfruitful in your life. We've got to get, what, so what do we need to do? Get our eyes on the Lord. John chapter 14 over in verse 27, he says, 
Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Remember, cares and also troubles. Don't let your heart get all troubled. Neither let it be afraid. You're going to have to guard yourself. Remember, fear is going to cause me men's hearts fail because of the fear of the things that are going to come down the line. You must guard yourself from getting, let anything evil get into your heart. We are to guard our heart with all diligence. That means we're going to keep the word in there. We're not going to let the enemy get to us at any time. And what else does he want you to do? Well, he wants you to keep your eyes on him because remember, he wants us to be at peace. Not only are we going to pray the word, but also Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. You got to get your mind stayed on the word. So you got to know the word. Without the word in your mind and your heart, uh, you're going to be reacting to whatever situation comes. This is why the word must get in you. And you also must be ready to take every thought captive because the attacks will come against your mind. All kind of thoughts, you're going to have to learn to govern your mind. 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. We've got to learn to take our thoughts captive. These are attacks from the enemy. Remember, you're to be ready Prepared and ready, this means, to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Obedience to God's word will be the key, taking your thoughts captive, doing what he says, praying the word, and God will keep you in peace. You mean to tell me we can stay in peace in the midst of all the things that are going on? Yeah. yeah. If you can't stay in peace now, you're going to be in trouble down the road. You've got to learn to stay in peace. God wants you to learn to cast every care, worry, anxiety in the Lord and pray the word and keep your eyes upon him. And that is so important. We see, go back over to Mark chapter 4 when we're looking here at these, verse 18, about the thorns. We saw the cares of this world, but then we also see the deceitfulness of riches. Getting your eyes on riches of this world. Now, we don't want to get our eyes on things. That's going to cause you to not be filled up with the things of God. In fact, what caused the church that it speaks of, the Laodicean church, to be in the state of being lukewarm? Remember in, Luke, or in Revelation 3.15, he said, I know thy works. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. He said, because you're lukewarm, you're neither cold nor hot. I'm going to spew thee or vomit you, essentially this means. Vomit and throw you out of my mouth. <laughs> These guys are going to be in trouble. Why are they lukewarm? Because thou sayest I'm rich. Well, I got all my natural needs met. That's why all these people that think that, well, I'm going to get everything, all my provisions and everything I need, you're going to be in trouble if you haven't got yourself established in the things of the Lord. I'm rich. I'm increased with goods. I got need of nothing. He says, you're wretched. You're miserable. You're poor. You're blind and naked spiritually. They were not filled up with the things of God. They weren't spiritually able to see. They didn't have spiritual provision. They didn't have their spiritual clothes on. They were looking just only at the temporal things in life instead of looking at the things that really count in that realm of the spirit. These guys were walking the wrong way. So if you get your eyes on the things on the natural and you think that that's going to bring you contentment and so forth, it's not. The deceitfulness of riches, it gets your eyes off the Lord and get your eyes on things. Don't get your eyes on things. You better have your eyes on the Lord. And also in Mark chapter 4, these things will choke out the word, see. Back to verse uh, 19. It says, lusts of other things, strong desires for other things. Remember, cares or deceitfulness of riches, temptations, or lusts are not causing problems to come to you unless they enter in. It means the temptations will be there just don't let them enter in. Don't partake of them. Don't allow them to work in your life. You'd be ready to resist all these things and do what the Word says. You can't lust of other, let lusts of other things enter in. Remember that James chapter 1, verse 14 says, Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust, his own strong desire, and he gets enticed or he's been caught. He's been deceived, he's been caught in a trap. Because he's given place to it. 
That's why you've got to be ready to conquer every lust of the flesh that's coming at you. And he says, when lust is conceived, if it does take root in you because you yielded to it, it brings forth sin. The lust is not sin in itself unless it takes root because you received it, you acted upon it. And when sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. This is why, what's the answer? The answer is to walk in the Spirit according to the Word of God. Because remember, your flesh is a body of death and it does not want to walk in the ways of the Lord. It's not going to. Galatians 5.16, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts, the strong desire of the flesh. The strong desire of the flesh is always there. You've got to be walking in the Spirit which is the way of the Word of God. You've got to be walking in, in that direction, then you won't fall for it. You can't just be in limbo and think you're going to get anywhere. No, the flesh is going to be rising up there. You've got to be walking this walk, following the way of the Spirit, which is the way of the Word of God, so you will not fulfill the lust. They will still be there. You're just not going to give place to them in your life. Over in Romans, we see something. Romans chapter 13, in verse 14, where it says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. This word, put ye on, is this word, enduo, which means to clothe oneself. We've seen this before. It's the same word when it talks about putting on the whole armor of God, or you put on the new man. It's essentially the same thing. You're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ through the word of God in you, the power of God in you, the putting on the new man so you think after his ways and walk in his ways. And this is something that you are responsible to do, by the way. This is a command, imperative mood. It is a middle voice. The middle voice means the subject is doing it for his own benefit, which means you must do this for your own benefit. You are going to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, clothing yourself through the Word. Then he says also, make not provision or forethought, this means. Don't make any forethought, otherwise we don't have a plan B. No, we only got plan A. We're following what the Word says, and that's it. We're not going to turn off in another direction. Make no forethought for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. No, we're going to stay in the Spirit. We're going to walk in the ways of the Spirit. If you fall into the ways of the flesh, what's going to happen? Uh, you're not going to be seeing victory come forth at all. Mark chapter 4, we go back to verse 19. What happens? It chokes the Word. The word gets choked out, otherwise it doesn't produce the fruit. And it becomes unfruitful. So the word becomes unfruitful. That means it's possible for the word of God that comes into you to not produce fruit if you let your eyes get off of that word. You get into care, worry, anxiety. You, you get your eyes on riches. You get your eyes and start responding to and yielding to the lusts of the flesh or lusts of other things. No. We've got to follow the way of the Word. Here it says, it, referring to the Word, becomes unfruitful. Over in Matthew's account of this, in verse 22, it says, The one who receives seed among the thorns is he that hears the Word, that care of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, it only brings out two of these, chokes the Word, and he becomes unfruitful. As the Word goes in you is the way you go. The Word is not fruitful, you're not fruitful in your life whatsoever. And also, in Luke's account, it also talks more about this, these, this lust of the flesh. In Luke chapter 8, verse 14, this is on the thorns, that which fell among the thorns of they which have heard, go forth and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of this life. They're seeking after pleasures. The world's always out there trying to get you to seek after all these pleasures of this, this bios life. What happens if you get your eyes and you're following up, oh, I want this pleasure and I want this fun thing and I want all these great things, pleasures of this life, you're going to choke out. The Word's going to get choked out of you. And it will bring no fruit to perfection. It won't come to maturity. It'll die out and it won't produce. In other words, we're not going to follow the lust of the flesh or the cares of this world affect this, and we're not going to follow up the pleasures of this life. We're not seeking after pleasures. Instead, we're going to seek after the Lord, 
and follow the Lord. There's too many Christians out there that have one foot in the world and the seeking after the pleasure and one foot supposedly is seeking after God. Well, they're getting choked out when they get into the seeking after the pleasures of this life. And that is a mistake. And both the word's unfruitful and the person becomes unfruitful. Well, the fourth type is the good ground. The, that's the one that is going to produce. In Mark chapter 4, we see over here in verse 20. These are they who were sown on the good ground. So what are the characteristics of the good ground? He hears the word, just like all the rest. He receives it. This is a reception to it, paradecamai. He took hold of it, or a had a, a, a ready reception of it near to him. And he also, of course, took hold of it, because all the other things about what, how you take hold of the word would also be involved in seeing good fruit. So he has a ready reception for it, and he also takes hold of it in his life. And he brings forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, some 100. It will be little fruit, more fruit, much fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. We get little fruit, so then we go through the cleansing process and we will bring forth much fruit. And that's important to understand from John chapter 15. We talk about the fruit bearing. Remember in John 15, 1, I'm the true vine, my father's the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit he takes away, but every branch that bears fruit, that's the much beginning stage, he purges it, cleanses it, that it may bring forth more fruit. That's the second stage, where now we're bringing forth more fruit. And then he wants us to come to the place, as we see in verse 5, that he that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth the much fruit. So we go the fruit 30-fold. We go to the more fruit through the cleansing process, the 60-fold. The, the, uh, and then we come to the much fruit which is the person who comes to the place of abiding in Him. So hearing the Word and coming to the place of going through the cleansing process, bringing forth fruit, more fruit, much fruit, abiding in it, is going to be absolutely essential if you are going to see fruit come forth in your life. We also see and see the Word produce. In Matthew's account now, we go over to Matthew's account, in Matthew 13, verse 23. He that receives seed into the good ground is he that hears the word. So this guy's hearing the word. He's continually, continually hearing the word, present tense. He's understanding it. He's taking hold of it. He's receptive. He has a spiritual understanding, which is important, as he's got the revelation of it, because, of course, when you do the truth, you come to the light. Doing the word is the key. The guy who does the word will come to the spiritual understanding. And he bears fruit, brings forth some 100, some 60, and some 30. So he's bringing forth fruit. In Luke chapter 8, we see something else that is brought forth. In Luke chapter 8, we pick up over here, and we come down to verse 15. That on the good ground are they which in an honest and a good heart, having heard the word, keep it, they retain it, they hold on to it, and they bring forth fruit with patience, upamone. This brings some other things that are important. You hear the word, you have a ready reception for it, you're taking hold of it, you get the foundation laid as you apply all these things together. You come to the place where you're hearing and doing the word, you're not giving place, to, you're casting the cares upon the Lord, you're overcoming all these things that would come to attack you. And one of the keys is you must have an honest, and a good heart. And honest, this is the word kalos, which refers to right attitude of heart towards God and towards man. A right attitude of heart towards God and towards man. And then, then it says here, this is a different word, a good heart. This is the word agathos, which refers to that which is a good and beneficial receptive heart, one that's ready to receive and take hold of it, and will not let anything come into it that would hinder it. It's not going to doubt. It's not going to waver. It's going to stay steadfast. A good heart is one that's staying steadfast on the Word. So we need to have a right heart towards God and towards man, which means we're walking in line with His ways. We don't have sin. We don't have unforgiveness towards people, bitterness and resentment. That's the kalos heart. 
but also then the agathos heart. That's the good, beneficial, receptive heart that's going to take hold of it and it's going to not let any doubt, unbelief, or anything get into your heart that would stop you from being able to receive the promise of God, which means you're going to conquer every attack, the temptation, the affliction, the persecution, whatever is coming against you, the cares, deceitfulness of the riches, the lusts of other things. You're going to conquer all these things. That's going to be imperative if you have a right heart towards God and man and a right heart to be able to take hold of all the things that God has for you. Also, this guy keeps it. He retains it. That means you're going to ward off every attack that the enemy brings. You're going to keep this. You're going to retain the word. And the word's not going out of you. Anytime the devil's coming to attack, you're going to deal with him successfully. And you are going to keep this word in the midst of your heart. You're going to guard it. And then you're going to bring forth fruit with patience. And this is one other aspect. Patience is the word hupomone. And what does that speak of? That speaks of steadfastness, it means, and constancy. And where does that work? Hupomone, patience, is that which works in the soulish realm. In Luke 21, verse 19, In your patience, hupomone, possess ye your souls. Where is the battleground with the enemy? In the soulish realm. The attacks coming against your will, your mind, your emotions, trying to work through feelings, thoughts, all kinds of things. So in your steadfastness in the soul, you're going to possess control in the area of the soul. And that's so important. You've got to be ready to be steadfast in the face of all these trials. In fact, James even talks about this. When you have these temptations coming against you, knowing this, it's the trying of your faith that's coming against you, what's it going to do? It's going to work or bring into operation steadfastness in the soul. Remember, the word is written into your heart, but where else is it written? In your mind, in the soulish realm. So you'll be steadfast. That means your thoughts are going to be important. Remember, with your mind, you'll serve the law of God, but if with the flesh, you'll serve the law of sin. Wherever your mind is after is the key. If you have a mind after the flesh, you're not going to be steadfast. You've got to have a mind after the Spirit, and you then will be steadfast on the Word of God. And it says you have to let steadfastness have its perfect, perfecting, completing work that you might be perfect and entire or complete, lacking, wanting nothing. Otherwise, you need faith and you need patience or steadfastness working. We can even kind of see this over in Hebrews chapter 10 where it speaks of in verse uh, 35. Cast not away your confidence. That comes because of the word in you, of you having your, your soul anchored in the word. Cast not away your confidence, which has a great recompense of reward. Your confidence comes because of hope, confident expectancy. In fact, we'll come back to this in a moment. In Hebrews chapter 6, what does it speak here in verse 19? Hope we have as the anchor of the soul. Your soul needs to be so anchored in the word, nothing is going to shake you. Your soul is where the attacks is. That's why you've got to abstain from fleshly lust that will war against your soul. You've got to stop, keep, stop anything that's trying to get to your soul to get you unanchored, so to speak, from the Word of God. And so, what does he say we need to do? We're, gonna, we're not going to cast away our confidence. Never cast away your confidence. It has a great recompense of reward. It will bring forth the promise and the blessing. But what do you have need of? You have need of patience, steadfastness. You've got to be steadfast because the attacks will come against your mind. They'll try to get you wearied, faint. Man ought always to pray not to faint. That's being steadfast. You know, he tries to, whatever a man sows, he's going to reap. If, as long as you don't faint, get wearied, you know, draw back. Uh, that's the enemy coming against you in the area of your mind. You have need of steadfastness that after you've done the will of God that you might receive or carry off this means the promise, seeing it come to pass in your life. So this is talking about you, how you're going to bring forth fruit in your life. And of course, the other thing which we implies from all that we've talked about is being a doer of the word. If you're not a doer of the word, are you going to come to the light and have spiritual understanding? 
No. If you're not a doer of the word, are you going to build your foundation and get the root system established? No. You're going to get wiped out by the st storms that come. You're going to fall away or get you know, stumble or you're going to uh, stand away in the time of temptation. You've got to be a doer of the word to hold fast to it. You've got to be a doer of the word to deal with all the attacks that come against you, whether it's affliction or persecution or whatever thing is coming at you. That's going to be mandatory. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. People that don't do the word, they're wondering why things just didn't seem to work out. That's because the devil got to the word. He either got it out of your heart, or you stood away from it, or you got it choked out at some point in time, and it didn't bring forth the fruitfulness. It might have been working for a while, but it didn't bring it forth because the devil was successful. See, we got to be the good ground, and we're going to be doers of the word. What happens to the doers? Who looks in the perfect law of liberty, continues therein. He's not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work. The man will be blessed in his deed. You're a doer of the work. You're going to be working the word, doing it. You'll see the blessing come forth in your doing. Literally is what this says, what you're carrying out. So what do we see? We see the parable of the sower. And what's the good ground? You hear the word, you hear it continually. You take hold of a ready reception for it, you take hold of it and apply it in your life. You're consistently doing it. As you do the word, you'll come to the place of spiritual understanding and you just maintain it as you continue to do the word. Also, you're going to hold on to it, keep hold it fast. You're not going to let anything take it away. You're going to retain the word. You're going to be ready to deal with the afflictions, attacks that come against you. You're going to have a right heart of attitude towards God, of course, and towards man, because if the devil can get you into sin, he can stop the word from producing. He gets you into bitterness, resentment, or anger, that shuts you down. You're not forgiven of your sins if you've got sins in the camp against God. Well, now the devil's going to stop you from seeing the word come forth because you got yourself out of being fellowship, in right fellowship with the Lord. Or if he gets you to the place of doubt, wavering, unbelief, or not, you know, anything that would come that would get your mind to get off track, double-minded, the double-minded guy can't receive anything from the Lord. You also got to be ready to conquer the affliction, the persecution, the temptations, the cares, the deceitfulness of riches, loss of other things, anything that tries to get you off the Word. No, we're going to keep our eyes on the Word. We're going to keep doing the Word. We're going to keep praying the Word. We're going to keep speaking the Word. We're going to keep walking in it. We're going to be steadfast. Our soul is going to be so anchored. It's not going to be moved. We're not about to cast away our confidence. We'll be a consistent doer of it, and we will see the fruit come forth. And as we go through the cleansing process, of course, we're going to bring forth fruit. We're going to bring forth more fruit as we continue. You continue in something, it's going to multiply. The word will multiply in your life and increase more fruit. And you'll come to the place of having much fruit. The 30, 60, 100 fold, it will abound in your life as you do what the word's necessary to bring forth fruit. The parable of sower is very important because it reveals what's necessary. Also, the enemy's attack. We cannot let the enemy take the word out of our heart ever again. We are going to hear and do the word. We're going to walk in it. We're going to be ready for his attacks. We're going to bring forth fruit, more fruit, and much fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word that brings revelation of the parable of the sower, which is essential to know, to understand the parables, to bring forth fruit, and to overcome the enemy, and see the word accomplish what God purposes. I thank you. I am going to be the good ground, for I will hear the word, I will take hold of it, I will have a ready reception to it, I will do what it says, I will have spiritual understanding, and I will continue in it as I walk in the word, walking in the Spirit, I will hold fast to it. I will always have a right heart towards God and towards man. No sin in my life. That'll stop the Word. I will have a good heart, ready to take hold of the promises of God. No doubt, no wavering, no unbelief. I'm fully persuaded and I'm taking hold of it and speaking it into being to bring it to pass.
doing what the Word says. I will conquer all pressure, all persecution, any temptations, cares and anxieties. I cast them upon the Lord. Deceitfulness of riches. I'm after the riches of Christ. Lusts of other things. Pleasures of this life. I'm not after those. I'm after Christ and what he brings forth, bringing his fruit in my life. I will be steadfast in the soulish realm and I will be a consistent doer. I will never cast away my confidence. I will keep my mind upon the word. I will stay in perfect peace and I will bring forth fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. Thank you, Father. I will be a doer of this word. I will conquer the spiritual warfare that the enemy would bring against me. I know it's coming for the word, not for me. It's trying to get the word out. To stop God from working in my life to bring forth what he purposes. I thank you. I'll be a doer of this word and I will see great fruit come forth in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. This is so important. This is why the devil will try to, anything he can get, just get you in some sin area. An area. Ah, he, he did it. Get you in some unforgiveness. Ah, he's got you. Get you in some little bit of doubt. He's got you. Get you in just cares, worries, anxieties. He's got you. Get you into yielding to some of the lusts, pleasures of this life. He's got you. Well, get your eyes on riches. He's got you. Any of these things, he's got you. And he's stopping the word. It's not producing. It's going to choke it out. That's why we got to be wise. Our eyes are on the Lord. We're following him, doing what his word says. That is the way of victory and fruitfulness in our life. Father, we thank you. We're going to be hearers and doers of this word. And we thank you. There will be the 30, 60, 100 fold fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.